take a few minutes to talk about uh, a journey that I went on uh, after doing a lot of meditation, a lot of yoga. Uh, I found myself one morning doing a yoga posture and uh, went up into it one way and came back down and my referential narrative, blah, blah, had just stopped. It was just completely zero. It's been that way for 14 years now, except when my blood sugar gets very low or I get very tired. But that's really how my life goes. It's just completely still inside, and yet I can still pass for being functional. And so what this talk will be about is the exploration, I'm a subject in five studies, the exploration that we've done in trying to understand how this could be possible. I mean, how could this persistent state of quietness, this no, no blah blah, uh, happen? And uh, whether correlates with what we're all here, psilocybin, which is surprising to many people. The fact that my thoughts stopped should not have been a big surprise. It was a big surprise that it happened the way it did. All of the people who were in my lineages, the people that I, all the stuff that I studied and studied with and studied of, you can see rolled down the page here, they all posit this, even Patanjali, as the possible goal of yoga and all these, this work. So it should not be a strange thing that this occurs. It's unfortunate it's so infrequent. I wish it were a lot more frequent. It's not, but it's not unexpected. We did not have, 15 years ago, a good context within which to even discuss something like this until we came up with this default mode network. A default mode network is exactly that. When you aren't doing something, which pretty much occupies your attention, you go by default to a different network. This default mode network, we used to believe that when we weren't doing something, the brain was just quiet. But we found that was wrong when, the brain's not, when we're not doing something, the brain's doing something else. It's doing blah, blah, and it's running the body. So the bottom picture, uh, whether she's tasking or not tasking, is the more real picture the brain is active in both situations, tasking or non-tasking. The best uh, analysis of what this default mode network is was give, come out of a Harvard paper in 2010 in Neuron by Andrews Hanna. And uh, this is really, I'll have to move to this one. Uh, what they found out, uh, there are many other cuts at this, but what they came up with was that there are two main centers of an 11 uh, center network that constitute this default mode network. A big sample size, 145 people, so high accuracy, high correlation coefficients. These two centers, this posterior singlet cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex are the two cores. Uh, outside of that, there are two other subnetworks of nine cores. Uh, one of these is for self and other, you, know, you and your chair, you and your friends. If this network shuts down, then there is no other and you have oneness. Everything is one thing, the mystical experience. You shut down the other side, self in time goes away. So you don't have any sense of being anything other than now, 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 now. So you live in the eternal present. So these are the precursors, maybe even the causative factors, in how we get mystical experiences. Let's just focus on this guy right here, this PCC, which is very deep. I can't get to it. That's right there. You can see in, this, in the A picture, left-hand corner, it's very deep in the core of the brain, far down inside the center, uh, posterior singlet cortex. But if it's out, it turns out that the whole thing kind of falls apart. The first uh, good work we have on parsing out um, the brain through meditation in 2007 by Farb, University of Toronto. What they found is that with not very much meditation by standards, 45 minutes a day, two months, standard plain old John Kabat-Zinn mindfulness meditation, that you did in fact, this was the network we just talked about, the two yellow balls, PCC, the prefrontal cortex. This is the blah blah network, blah blah functioning here. With two months, 45 minutes, turns out Blah, blah was replaced by now, 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 now network. A different place, pretty much down the right-hand side of the brain, insula, lower prefrontal cortex, posterior parietal. So this network replaced that network. 
first, chance, first time we've seen we could actually parse out with meditation brain functionality. Two very discrete ways of having the brain operate. Farb did some little more, little more detail. This picture, a little hard to see. These are the meditators. These are the controls. And you can see blah, blah, uh, deactivated in the meditators. Now, 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 activated strongly in the meditators. So clear confirmation that we can parse out in the brain whether we're blah, blah, or now, now, now. However, good news, bad news, after meditation, they're back to blah, blah. So we haven't been able to establish with 45 minutes and two months a clear pattern to stay out of blah, blah. So what we do, this is my buddy Judd Brewer at Yale. I'm a sub subject in this study. A PNAS paper last fall came out uh, and got a lot of press that, again, looking at this default mode network, but now with 10,000 hour meditators. Uh, these are all Theravadans. There's a Theravadan nest up in Yale. They're all Theravadans. And, and uh, they have the same meditational procedures, same protocols. And so because of that, they can get a very tight uh, correlation of a very small sample size. And what they found was, duh, the same old thing all over again. Uh, PCC deactivated, medial prefrontal cortex deactivated, uh, three different kind of meditational techniques, Theravadan, same result in all three situations. So, ta-da, we reproved far. The big difference was whether or not they were meditating, no blah, blah. That was a big change. We found 10,000 hours we could, in fact, make this other network we showed earlier be persistent. The really interesting stuff out of Judd's work, for me anyway, was, was how this might be maintained. It's not enough to just shut it down. How do you somehow within the brain generate some network to control this thing so it stays quiet? Turns out, and this is a complicated set here, um, these are the differences. These are the meditators, and that far one is the controls. So what we've got is meditators minus controls is this thing here. And what it tells us, and this is baseline meditation, baseline meditation. Slice, vertical slice, horizontal slice. The big news here is that as we have shut down the PCC, and the medial prefrontal cortex, we have up-activated another center, this anterior cingulate cortex, which appears to be kind of a, how are things going down there watching this? And we, I believe, it's watching to see if this DMN starts back up again. We also found that <clears throat> you also up-activate, and this was true whether meditating, meditating or not meditating, the ACC was active, which supports the no blah blah with no meditation. Baseline meditation again, lateral prefrontal cortex, the same thing we saw in the FARB study, the very front of the now, now, now network, this shows its head again. So we've confirmed once again that we do have, now have some kind of monitoring and control network established to watch over this shutting down of the default mode network. The big surprise, this was, this was confirmatory, I was happy, Judd was happy, we had an explanation, at least something it looked like within the parameters that we're looking at, you could actually explain how you could maintain a state of, for 14 years, pretty much emptiness. You've got two centers watching two other centers, and you're keeping those shut down. The big surprise was, Judd sent me a paper, said, Judd, take a look at this. And so I got into it, and um, this is a UK-based organization. February, two months after Judd's paper, they came out and said, oh, we can do this, and we can look at this and this. We can look at what happens in fMRI if we give people medium-level doses of magic mushrooms, psilocybin. They don't actually crush up the mushrooms. And, but IV psilocybin, medium-level dose. And what Robin found was this, that as you gave... Uh, IV psilocybin, medium dose levels, and you saw uh, that go, go along with time after infusion, you can see how dramatically, and this is our good old friend again, the PCC. The PCC blood flow dropped dramatically when you put psilocybin in. 
So once again, we're deactivating the PCC by putting in psilocybin. Amazing. It's the same thing we saw with meditation. Also, and this is a change in blood flow into the PCC, as this drops, extremely intense effects happen, which is why people take psilocybin. So the more you shut down the PCC, the more you get psychedelic mystical effects. Not a surprise, confirming what we saw before with meditation. Something else that Robin looked at was connectivity, which is do two centers cooperate? Do they talk to each other? Uh, are they online at the same time and are they likely to be working together? In fact, that's what happens. And our good friend over there on the left in blue, that's deactivated, and you compare it to this center. This is one of the yellow balls. That's the blue one's the other of the yellow balls. And what this says is that that one's not talking to this one. So that DMN, that default mode network of those two core yellow uh, spheres, is not talking. It's shut down. Psilocybin did the same thing that we did with normal meditation. Shut down the same network. At the same time, you have up-activated our old friend, the ACC. Same story we had before twice. Confirming with psilocybin, you're getting exactly the same phenomena, at least as far as looking at these centers as you saw with meditation, 10,000 hour plus meditation. As far as experiences on psilocybin, magic mushrooms, you probably can't read these, but it's, it's all the things you would expect. We talked about shutting down the sides, the subnetworks, and the default mode network. Self and other disappears, self and time disappears. Well, duh, what you see here is that my sense of time was altered. My sense of space was altered. Things look strange. Uh, <laughs> Etc. It's exactly what you'd expect from what we've laid out as, a, as a, an idea here. These, that's higher and lower, psilocybin and placebo. This is this is fellow there sitting in a sweater. This is his work, uh, Roland Griffiths. There is a really top-notch uh, psilocybin program in the U.S. been running for 12 years. Roland Griffiths started it. It's running at Hopkins. Uh, we had a thing meeting with them a couple weeks ago in, in Penn. And uh, as far as somebody doing uh, entheogenics is a new word. You know, N is inside, theo is divinity, and genetic is you know, genes bringing in. So we're trying to create the infinite inside. Entheogenics is kind of the new word for psychedelics. But Rowan has run this, three seminal papers. You can see them listed here. He's talking this afternoon at 4.30. Sometime around that. He's talking this afternoon. And what Roland found, and I pulled this out of his papers, was that, in fact, psilocybin produces good outcomes. No surprise, mystical experiences, they were very careful at selecting who they were going to use in the study. They were spiritually inclined. And it was, surprisingly, uh, two-thirds of the folks had, had no bad trips. Uh, One-third had some disturbances. But even for all, for all that whole population, they said that it was the top five or their single most important meaningful life experience. I'm not pushing drugs here. Because I, I'll tell you, I'm an absolute virgin on psychedelics. I just timed out uh, to, to not take them until I had another big experience non-dually. When I had that, then I just went that direction. Because maybe my personality, I would have been using them like crazy. Uh, <laughs> so very meaningful life experiences. If you look down here, long-term positive changes Roland has found in his studies, interpersonally, well-being, uh, behaviors, good long-term outcomes. The ongoing activity at Hopkins, I'm kind of a shill for Roland for this afternoon, um, our old friend, default mode network, blah, blah, and there's a current study ongoing with teaching meditators how to do it with psilocybin, a new study coming up with psilocybin on long-term meditators. Roland will talk about it more this afternoon, I'm sure. This is, where's Combs? There he is. He was the, he and two other folks were on the doctoral committee 
for Jeffrey Martin. And what Jeffrey did was try to go around and look at people who have reported uh, persistent non-duality, persistent stillness, persistent quietness, persistent, persistent phenomena described in, in this. Any, anybody who had claimed something like that, self-reported persistent behaviors, they were in the study, at least for first consideration. I call these people serpents, self-reported persistent non-symbolics. So there's serpents, these serpents, the serpents, there were 500 original serpents, and out of that came 52 who were invited, and 36 of us actually did the whole, the whole drill. Uh, Ralph Hood was also, well, Mr. Colt, on Jeffrey's doctoral committee. So the Hood mysticism scale is kind of the standard for looking at myths. How much time? Four minutes, okay. This is, uh, was a 160 to 32 scale on that. The serpents averaged 52. Nine of us were 160s. Uh, and if you look at us against psychedelics, contemplatives, and psychotics, uh, as high or statistically equal to uh, psychedelic folks. And we are persistently more mystical than just taking a trip. It's that way basically all the time. These are the, these are the Hood Mysticism Scale statements. Some of the ones, if you look at a lot of these, you rate them, this, this is yes, my experience, not my experience, etc. cetera. Uh, that's what goes into the matrix. And so what I did, completely, uh, not, well, not, not, science, not scientific, no, not non-scientifically. I said, okay, um, people I know and I work with, I want to out all my, all my students, but the people I work with, many of them have used psychedelics. Uh, they're contemporaries of mine, and they've, they've done all kinds of things. And so we looked at sex drugs and non-duality and, and compared <laughs> sex drugs and non-duality. And what we found, we looked at those three things, and we also looked at, okay, what's duality like after you've had a non-dual experience? And what's duality like if you haven't had one? So I asked him, one to 10 scale, give me your numbers, typical pleasure. And so what we did in the one to 10 scale, and th there's a, a fair number of people in this study. I will not give you their names. What we found, and there's some parallax here, is that entheogenics, psychedelics, are like 9.5. And this is basically all the serotonergic psychedelics. Uh, DMT, ayahuasca, LSD, they're all in this category. Sexual orgasm is an eight, compared to a 9.5 for this. Uh, as the Buddhist said, it would have to be that way. If it wasn't that way, we'd have no meditators. <laughs> <laughs> and non-dual, folks were saying it was better, and this has been a consistent report from people that I've, I've worked with, Consistently, they say it's higher than their experiences with the serotonergic psychedelics. Dual state after non-dual, six. Dual state uh, without non-dual, three. Conclusions. Uh, you can read these down, best I can tell them to you. Uh, the idea was that we do have a good correspondence and we can learn from both uh, psychedelics and from meditation how to parse out how the brain's functioning. Uh, meditation has been very useful to understand the brain. In my own personal selfish perspective, uh, understanding how this quietness can last on for so long and how the, functioning, how the brain functions with that. You can just read through those. Uh, I'm not selling anything. Uh, I, have, I, have nothing. I sell nothing. I, I've got a book, but any profits go to kids in South India. So uh, anyway, blog, blogs active, YouTube, website. Book. Any questions in the one minute we have left?